Hello, my name is Dr. Samara Rashid, and today I will be giving a lecture on periodontics, which is chapter 55 from the Modern Dental Assisting Textbook, edition number 13. This chapter can be found on page 845 in your Modern Dental Assisting Textbook. In periodontics, we would like to describe the role of the dental assistant in the periodontal practice and identify and describe the instruments that are used in such a field. We also want to discuss the hand scaling and the ultra ultrasonic scaling aspect of it as well. Periodontics on the whole is a specialty that's used for diagnosing and treatment of periodontal diseases. And that's those diseases that affect the supporting structure or the periodontium of the teeth. And that includes gingiva, bone, and periodontal ligament. But a periodontist has three years of post-training after they finish four years of dental school training. Most patients are referred to the periodontist from a general dentist practice. After the periodontal treatment, though, the patient is usually maintained between the two practices. So a periodontal exam includes many of the same evaluations as in a general dentist practice. There's a medical history, a dental history, there's radiographic evaluations. You have to examine the teeth, the oral tissues, the periodontium. You got to look at the periodontal charting, which includes pocket readings. If you remember the numbers, uh, like like um, a, a, a charting of recording one, two, three, and you'll, you'll recall that uh, from when, when we went over that in DNA 113 or in, diff or in the different courses that you have already, um, already completed. Uh, we also want to look at if there's any furcation involvement of the molars or premolars. You wanna see if there's any tooth mobility, if they move, if there's any pus coming out or exudate, and also any gingival rec recession. So this overall charting is important information for our diagnosing and treatment of these periodontal diseases because you wanna see what the patient presents with and what they need. And this is how there's a computerized diagram that shows you um, the periodontal uh, charting, uh, so to say. So you can see the dots uh, and you can see the probing depth. So when they call out the probing numbers, okay? And then uh, you can see that there's recession and they have these numbers for recession, okay? And also mobility. You'll see that there's mobility listed as plus one, plus one. Uh, as you can see, this one is really mobile because it's a plus two, et cetera. With the medical and dental history, we want to know if there's any systemic diseases. Uh, many diseases can um, can kind of, show what well, can it kind of come through or be expressed through periodontal problems um, and treatment outcomes, because we want to make sure that what would be the, the right treatment for this patient in order to get the proper outcome, despite whatever uh, systemic disease they have, okay? Is this patient going to have uh, no treatment, like, like no, uh, no effects of treatment because of the systemic disease that they have? Uh, so those are things you want to consider. You want to evaluate the dental history. Uh, what is their inflammation? What is their gingival bleeding? Um, do they have any pus? What is the color, size, and shape, and texture of their gingiva? And are there deep pockets as well? Uh, we talked about mobility. We want to see if there's any loss of bony support. We want to see, uh, is there any plaque, calculus, or bleeding around the tissues? Um, we talked about the periodontal probing because normal readings are supposed to be less than three millimeters, but anything greater than three millimeters indicates that there's something going on. There's some sort of loss of attachment and maybe, just maybe even some bone loss. So the greater the probing depths, the more severe the disease, okay? And this is how we detect if there's mobility in a tooth. You can see here that they're using two ends of an instrument. It's usually the handles. You don't want to use your fingers because your fingers kind of move and it's hard to assess. So here you can assess it better uh, with two ends of, a, of an instrument. And you kind of go back and forth to uh, see what is the mobility class of the tooth. All right, um, so the A side on the left shows normal sulcus depth, okay? Normal sulcus depth right here. But then you look at the B side and you see that there's some calculus drawn here. So now there is a periodontal pocket. So with time, the, 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 the tissues kind of pulled away. They receded along with the bone. So you can imagine if you had a periodontal probe, you remember that instrument with the lines on it? If you sink it here, what's going to be the difference between sinking it here versus sinking it here, right? So 
let's say they're both three millimeters. If you sink a periodontal probe here with three millimeters, uh, okay, yeah, so maybe it's four millimeters. Let's say, you know, the gingival kind of went over, they got some gingivitis. But if they have a three millimeter here, don't we also have to consider the loss set that we have already over here? So the gums have already pulled away, but yeah, now we're getting three millimeters on top of that. So that's something you have to think about. Think about. Here's your periodontal probe that I mentioned. Um, it's, you know, they're measured in millimeters with the lines. And what they do is the millimeter measurement indicates the distance from the margin, the gingival margin, which would be right here to the base of the pocket. And what you do is you take the periodontal probe, you slip it into the pocket just enough where you feel resistance. You don't want to go harder. It hurts the patient. So you just want to go ever so slightly uh, just to see what the recording is. And most likely this is a two. Okay, so six probing depths are taken for each tooth. There's three on the buckle and three on the lingual, okay? So that overall, you get six readings by using the probe, the periodontal probe. You also want to consider your radiographic um, evaluation. You want to look at the bone loss in the periodontal disease. You want to see a vertical bone loss, as you could see in A, vertical bone loss. Then you could see B and C, normal bone level at the alveolar crest, okay? This isn't exactly the best picture. But then you see severe vertical bone defect in letter D. This is severe. Okay. Um, let me just zoom out a little bit. Maybe this will make it easier. Here you go. Okay. So premolar vertical bite wing, as you can see, and then the molar, vert and the molar vertical bite wing. And you can see that they're often used to detect bone loss. Whereas when you have horizontal bite wings, you may miss how much bone loss you have. So you oftentimes see that uh, many... Uh, dental hygienists, most of them will take vertical um, vertical bite wings because they want to make sure they're able to capture how much bone loss there is. Now, what periodontal instruments do they use? Do people use? Now, obviously, we mentioned the periodontal probe. So there is periodontal therapy, which requires the use of specialized instruments to remove calculus, smooth the root surfaces, measure the periodontal pockets, and perform surgery. The dentist or the dental hygienist who uses these instruments takes responsibility for maintaining the sharpness of it because you're not doing justice to the patient if the instruments are dull, if they're dull, okay? So what are the dental conditions that contribute that can cause periodontal disease? Maybe migration of teeth, right? Maybe clenching or grinding, defective dental work, maybe mobility, maybe occlusal interference, maybe even root depressions, Okay. And as you can see here, this is after the tooth has been extracted. You could see that root concavities in the maxillary molar, see the little concavities, it decreased the effectiveness of debridement. Okay, so little concavities, what can happen is you can get debridement, debridement, no matter how much you try, uh, some teeth are just bound to come out because of the anatomy uh, once they experience that bone loss. So everybody has to do a periodontal assessment. Um, uh, hygienists and dentists have to do a periodontal assessment, so they have to look at how much plaque and calculus there is, how much recession there is, a bleeding index, uh, which is the percent of bleeding when you probe the tooth. We want to look at the pockets and the radiographs. Okay, and then the instruments that are used are the periodontal probes, periodontal explorers, the scalers and files, the curettes, surgical knives, and pocket markers. These are things we're going to see in the lab on Friday. The periodontal probe, you guys have been very experienced in it. You'll see that it's calibrated in millimeters. Okay, remember, we, we get a total of six. It's a blunted end. Um, it's a blunted rounded tip with the markings. And the and in millimeters, it's usually three, five, seven, and 10. That's just how it is. This is one right here. So three, five, seven, and 10. That's usually the, the case. You also have different probes uh, called furcation probe or your neighbor's probe, neighbor's probe. Um, and what it does, as you can see in the picture here, it's used to measure the pocket in the furcation, the horizontal or vertical pocket depths of multi-rooted teeth in furcation errors. Okay. Periodontal explorers are used to locate the calculus deposits, whether they're supra-gingival, meaning above the gingival, or sub-gingival, whether they're below the gingival. And they give you um, like a feel. It's more of a feel and you feel the texture. You can't really see 
the calculus when you go subjectively, when you use the Explorer. Uh, longer and more, they're longer and more curved than the regular pigtail um, explorers that you use. So they look a little different. The working ends are thin, fine. They can be manipulated around the root surface and they're long enough to reach the base of the pockets or even a furcation. And it looks just like this. Um, oh, rather, wait, wait one second. I, let's see if I have a better picture of it. I know in general explorers that you guys have been looking at with the shepherd's hook, okay, or the orbins, okay, or you got the pigtail. These are your general explorers, as you can see here. And this is in your textbook. But there are various styles of periodontal explorers. This is when you want to go subgingival. And see, as you can see, this is how low it goes. It, well, it goes only up to the base of the pocket. And then you want to glide it along the surface very gently to see if you feel any type of um, roughness or a speed bump. Because uh, if you feel a speed bump, that means there is calculus present there. Okay. All right, so the scalars and files. Now your book talks a little bit about scalars and files. So sickle scalars are used to remove large deposit of supra gingival calculus, supra gingival calculus. Chisels are used to remove supra gingival calculus, but more for anterior teeth. And then you got the hoe scalars. They're for heavy supra gingival calculus. Okay, and then the files, they crush extremely heavy calculus. So all of these are for supra gingival um, calculus. But curettes are different. Curettes are more for subgingival calculus, subgingival calculus. So um, they're used to remove subgingival sub calculus uh, to smooth rough root surfaces or root planing and remove the diseased soft tissue lining of the periodontal pocket. So a curette has a rounded end, unlike a scalar, which has a pointed end, a pointed end. So there's two basic designs of the curettes. There's a universal one and a gracie. So your universals are two cutting edges. So it adapts to all the tooth surfaces, but your Gracie's is one cutting edge because it's used for a specific tooth surface. When you're a hygienist, you're basically very involved with these instruments, very much involved with these instruments. Okay, here is a picture. Uh, it's also in your textbook. It's a comparison of scalars and curettes. And as you can see, the scalar is pointed in letter B. Right here, it's more pointed. And then you could see in letter A, it's a curette. But there is a reason uh, why it, it's pointed. If it's pointed, it's not going to go subgingival because what's going to happen is, well, let me see. Go back and refer to this. Yeah, your scalars are pointed because they only deal with supergingival calculus, supergingival calculus in this case. But when you deal with curettes, they're subgingival, and that is why the tips are blunted. Because if you take this and you go subgingival, you can shred the, the gums. You can really traumatize the gums. And that is why a curette is subgingival, subgingival. Okay, this is a, a curettes, and uh, they're for, one is for anterior and one is for posterior. And the way to look at this is a 2D picture, so it's hard to see that this is more, um, this has more kinks in it. A posterior curette, um, the reason why it has more kinks to it is so you can reach to the back of the mouth for the molars for posterior teeth and uh, curette the teeth. Whereas with anterior, there's, you know, it's not bent, uh, it's not angulated in different ways is because you're, you're, you're just dealing with the anterior teeth. So it doesn't really require any type of um, bends with your hands. It's mostly in the front. Okay, uh, universal curette here again. And with your great Gracie curettes, you could see they actually come in numbers. You have your five sixes, seven eights, 11 twelves, and your 13 fourteens. That's how specific it gets. Uh, your book talks a little bit about the surgical instruments in terms of knives. There's the Kirkland knife, and there's the Orban knife, and the periotomes. You'll be seeing this in lab as well. The Kirkland knife is one of the most commonly used knives. Uh, they're more kidney-shaped, more kidney-shaped. And then you have the Orbans. It's used to remove tissue from interdental areas. It's more spear-like. And then you have the periotomes. And those are used to cut periodontal ligaments for extraction, for extraction. Okay, Here's your Kirkland and K for kidney, right? Kidney-shaped. And here are your Orbins. Your Orbins really looks pretty high-end <laughs> high here. So Orbins looks like this. 
And then of course you have your pocket markers and that's placed at the base of the pocket. This is more for surgery, but it's used to make bleeding points at the base of the periodontal pocket and for when you want to slice or place incisions in the gingiva. So it's a great um, guide. You might've uh, seen the ultratonic scaler in the clinic, uh, or maybe you've seen them at the clinical rotations you venture out to, or maybe this was even used on you uh, oftentimes this is considered to be called a water pick, but it's really an ultrasonic scalar used by professionals. Um, it's used for rapid calculus removal. It reduces hand fatigue. It uses high frequency sound mixed with rapid or quick vibrations. And it uses a water coolant spray. And the purpose of the water is to cool off the instrument along with the tooth. It's just like a handpiece. That's why the water comes out because we want to cool it off. We don't want like it to be generating heat um, and again, this is recommended to be used with an HVE because there's a lot of water aerosols that, you know, develop and there's water everywhere. Uh, again, the ultrasonic tips vary for the Cavitron. You can see some of them are angulated, some of them are round, depending on what area of the mouth or what case you are dealing with. Uh, again, this is how the spray looks like. Okay. And this is how you position the ultrasonic scaler. Okay. So the indications, when do you use it? When you want to remove super gingival calculus or difficult stain, you want to remove sub gingival calculus, attach plaque or endotoxins that are on the root surface. You want to clean furcations. You want to remove deposits before surgery. You want to get rid of, believe it or not, orthodontic cements. You want to get rid of the bonding. You want to get rid of any overhanging margins or restorations. Okay, be careful though, in case... A patient uh, has a communicable disease like, like tuberculosis, for example, because of the aerosol. Immunocompromised patients, respiratory problems, swallowing difficulties, and even cardiac pacemakers. These are things you kind of want to know the medical history of them before you start using them. You don't want to use the ultrasonic scaler on demineralized areas because they are sensitive areas. They're delicate. Um, dentin, you, want, you don't want to use it on exposed dentin surfaces, which is on exposed roots, restorative materials, right? You don't want to use it on right on top of amalgams, for example. Implants, you'll scratch the implants or even narrow dental, periodontal pockets, narrow periodontal pockets. Um, so precautions for children. Young tissues are very sensitive. This is not something you use on children. Uh, it can cause a lot of uh, damage to the pulp tissue on newly erupted teeth. And also... You cannot use it on primary erupted teeth as well. Non-surgical periodontal treatment. I mean, there is, you know, dental prophylaxis. There's scaling and root planing. There is um, gingival curatage. You can use antimicrobial antibiotic agents in these areas. You can even locally deliver the antibiotics in these areas. Non-surgical treatment, please hold. Um, sorry about that. So dental prophylaxis, prophy or cleaning is used to remove all deposits from supra gingival tooth surface. This is a non-surgical treatment. It's only performed by a dentist or hygienist. Primary treatment, uh, primary treatment for gingivitis, that's also considered to be part of this category. Scaling and root planing, that's when you really go in with your curettes, you go in there with your uh, your knives, all of that. That's really important for periodontal. Uh, debridement, removal of calculus, plaque. So there's a lot of stuff or a component that goes into the non-surgical treatment of, of this field, of the periodontal field. Here's your uh, an example of how you hold the Gracie curette. Okay. Um, gingival curatage is another example of non-surgical treatment. Uh, cleaning gingival lining to remove the diseased tissue. Again, you maybe you want to deliver some antibiotics like tetracycline, penicillin, into the pockets, maybe even chlorhexidine. Um, you want to locally deliver, uh, you know, some agents to the pocket to heal. Uh, and usually these are dissolvable over time. However, your book talks a little bit about the surgical aspect of periodontal treatment. And that's indicated when you want to control the progress of the, of the destruction and the loss of attachment when the non-surgical part did not help, did not help. Okay. So periodontal surgery, what are the what are the pluses? What are the advantages of them? You are able to access root surface. You can access furcation. 
and it's easier for the patient to clean. But what are the negatives? There's a cost. You have to consider the health even and, and the age of the patient even more. The time frame, the aesthetics, the discomfort. So there's a lot that gets entailed. Some terms that we want to look at is something like gingivoplasty. Gingivoplasty is when you want to contour the gingiva. Gingivectomy, you want to you know remove diseased gingival tissue. There's incisional surgery, flap surgery. There's crown lengthening. There's soft tissue grafts. There's OSHA surgery. Now, remember, in OSHA surgery, you want to consider the contours or you want to modify bony defects. And there's osteoplasty. You want to kind of like reshape the bone or osteectomy which is you want to remove the bone, like you want to remove tori, for example. Gingivoplasty here, you want to reshape or remove hyperplastic uh, gingiva. Now, guys, this isn't, when you look at this, this is not gingivitis. This is something different. This is fibrotic. And many times, patients that are on certain medications, now I know you guys are taking uh, pharmacology, and in pharmacology, you'll learn of, of um, there, there's many medications that might cause gingival overgrowth. And that's not gingivitis. When you have gingival overgrowth, the, fi the, fi the fibrotic part of the gingiva tends to overgrow on top of the teeth. And you'll notice the coverage. So what happens in a gingivoplasty, you take your, um, your Kirkland and you can, you know, act or, or any scalpel and you can sort of cut this off. And, you know, ultimately you'll reshape or do a gingivoplasty of the gums. Okay, so that the patient can now uh, clean the teeth better. Okay. And of course this is under anesthesia, but understand that if the patient continues to be on this medication, you will, the, the, the gums will then, the fibrotic gums will then grow back to become right here in this picture uh, labeled A. And then they would have to come back with time to get that cut off again. Of course, this takes a while for it to grow back, but it is a side effect. Okay, so this is something, um, you know, that, that's before, this is something that's after. So it could be done due to aesthetics. Maybe someone has a very gummy smile, like this is a gummy smile. They would do a gingivoplasty such that they look like this, and now it's not so much of a gummy smile anymore. Full thickness flap surgery. Um, this is when you want to make an incis incision, and then you want to go in and you want to perform some sort of surgery. Okay. Open flap debridement. Once you make that incision and you open it up, you go in there with instruments, maybe even a cavitron or rather a, um, a water pick um, or any instrument. And you go in there and you want to clean or debride the area and then you put it back up and then you suture it, suture it. <coughs> okay. Uh, maybe you want to go not just clean it, you want to do an ostectomy or maybe even an osteoplasty. Whichever the case may be, there's many uh, procedures that you can do that can help you um, that can help you gain access to the areas under the gums and then you suture them up. Once you suture them up, you may want to have the area rinsed out or cleaned out, maybe deliver pain medication there or do an antibacterial rinse. And once that's done, you want to place what's called a periodontal dressing, which we will be doing Friday as well. Um, and in this case, you want to mix two. Uh, in, in this case, you have to mix the catalyst and the base together. This acts as a bandage, the periodontal dressing, and it kind of protects it while it's being healed, while it's being healed. And a lot of these cases, um, most often they don't have eugenol in them, eugenol in them. So these are usually non-eugenol dressings are the ones that are most often used. However, with the zinc ox ox oxide eugenol dressing, the ones that have that, they can experience burning a little bit, okay? Uh, it's supplied as a powder and a liquid that you mix beforehand. It's a very slow set time, but it allows a longer working time. You can manipulate the material better. It's firm, heavy in consistency, but great gives great good support. Um, but you don't want to use it in someone who is allergic to eugenol. Um, this is how you mix it. But non-eugenol dressing is more widely used. It comes in two tubes, a base and an accelerator. Uh, it's usually a one-to-one -one ratio, um, and it's a rapid setting time. Um, but if it's exposed to a warm environment like the mouth, it's going to set faster. Uh, it can't be mixed and stored in advance. So it can be mixed right then and there in front of the patients. You roll it up. And ultimately, when you roll it up, you place it in the area. And you can look at this YouTube link 
um, to see how they do that as well. There are other types of surgeries. So not everything is about a knife, right? There's laser surgeries, light amplification by stimulation emission of radiation. Uh, this vaporizes, cuts, and cauterizes tissue. The tissue heals faster. You have bleeding control, less trauma. It's done fast, but you got to be trained for it. Okay. Um, there is, I think you have to use some sort of eyeglasses with this. Uh, the matted finished instruments uh, should be used so that it doesn't reflect the laser beam. Uh, you want to protect that, you know, the non-target issues with the wet gauze. And you do uh, want to use the HVE because there's a little bit of a laser plume that comes out. Okay. So these, it's a, you know, you have to kind of be a little bit trained with this instrument or rather with this machinery. And those are my references. And I appreciate that. Thank you.